From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. The Western alliance of military powers has never seen anything quite like it. The U.S. President Donald Trump and other leaders of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization exchanged recriminations and insults as they began a two-day summit in Brussels. Minutes after arriving, President Trump launched an unprecedented attack on member countries. He said many of them were delinquents for not spending at least 2% of their GDP on defense as they had promised and he accused Germany of being captive to Russia because it takes so much of its energy from the Nord Stream gas pipeline from Russia. But Germany is totally controlled by Russia because they were getting from 60 to 70 percent of their energy from Russia and a new pipeline. And you tell me if that's appropriate because I think it's not. And I think it's a very bad thing for NATO and I don't think it should have happened. In an unusually candid reply, the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg told Trump that NATO was good for the United States because it helped project U.S. power in the Middle East and Africa, as well as against Russia. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel also responded. You know, NATO is an alliance of 29 nations, and uh, there are sometimes differences and uh, different views and also some disagreements, and the uh, gas uh, uh, pipeline from Russia to Germany is one issue where allies uh, disagree. But the strength of NATO is that despite these differences, we have always been able to unite around our core task uh, to protect and defend each other because we understand that we are stronger together than uh, apart. I think that two world wars and the Cold War thought was that uh, we are stronger together than apart. I would like to take this opportunity in light of recent events that I have myself witnessed that parts of Germany was under Russian control. And I'm very happy that today we are unified in freedom as the Federal Republic of Germany. And that's why we can say that we make our own politics and make our own decisions. That's very good, especially for the people in the new federal states. Earlier, European Council President Donald Tusk told U.S. President Donald Trump to stop berating NATO allies over military investment levels on the eve of an alliance summit. I would therefore have two remarks here. First of all, the America appreciate your allies. After all, you don't have that many. And the Europe spend more on your defense because everyone respects an ally that is well prepared and equipped. For the first time in Colombia, a retired general has submitted himself to the special jurisdiction for peace, the body set up to judge crimes committed during the country's armed conflict. General. Retired General Henry William Torres Escalante met with the special jurisdiction for peace. He's the first high-ranking military officer who meets with the organism. He came to express his voluntary legal submission to the GEP. He's also here to inform the GEP about all the legal processes he's involved in. Torres Escalante is linked to the murder of Daniel Torres and his son, Roque, as well as Aguazul and Casanare Campesinos in 2007. They were falsely branded as guerrilla members when he was the commander of the 16th Brigade of the Army. We cannot deny that these victims, for which I am being indicted, were wronged. These actions were carried out by my men. I didn't know about it or give the order to kill those people. That's why I want to apologize to the victims for the damage caused, hoping that this will never happen again. According to human rights reports of Casanare, 113 extrajudicial executions took place from 2005 until 2007. From the beginning, the general stated that he is innocent. You must review this situation and consider immediately sending this to the Truth Commission. The general's defense team stated that there are around seven cases filed against their client and asked the judge to look into all of them. This is the first chance he's gotten to publicly express what happened. He wanted to say that the ordinary jurisdiction acted in a prejudiced way against him. 
Torre de Escalante is the first high-ranking military commander to show up in front of the JEP. Victims and organizations hope this is the beginning of many other high-ranking officers coming and telling the truth of what they ordered the troops to do during the armed conflict. The Colombian police have captured Jesus Vargas, also known as Reinen, a leader of the Oliver Sinesterra Front, allegedly involved in the kidnapping and killing of an Ecuadorian team of journalists on the border between Ecuador and Colombia. Vargas was captured in the Colombian department of Cauca. Police said Vargas was responsible for the custody of the team of journalists. He is fourth in the line of command of the armed group led by Guacho. There is a commitment from the Colombian state, in this case from the police and the Attorney General's office, to capture everyone who has been involved in the killing of the three Ecuadorian journalists. The general strike that took over the streets of Haiti for the past two days has come to an end. On Monday, several shops opened their doors in an attempt to return to normalcy. Lines continue to form at one of the few open gas stations in capital city, Port-au-Prince. At least three people died during the protests to reject an increase in fuel prices, which was later revoked. The price hike was part of a demand by the International Monetary Fund. And the Bahamas are keeping a close eye on the situation in Haiti. The Minister of Foreign Affairs said they're standing by for a possible influx of refugees. There's a likelihood that boats will sail toward the Bahamas when you have challenges in Haiti. And so we're watching it day by day and staying really in close contact with our people. Every day, crowds of Mexican citizens gather outside the party's headquarters of President-elect Andres Manuel López Obrador looking for help. Dozens of citizens arrive daily at the offices of Morena, hoping for an audience with the president-elect. They ask for his personal intervention on a range of issues, from justice to jobs. Citizens are placing great expectations on their next leader. His term in office will begin on December 1st. All of our savings were stolen by Fikria, a financial services company working on behalf of Enrique Pinanito's government. About 7,000 of us in total had our savings in that fund, many of whom are senior citizens or single mothers like me. Now we are here with the hope that López Obrador can help us. López Obrador is due to meet on Friday with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Trump's son-in-law and advisor Jared Kushner, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and others for talks in Mexico City. Mexican president-elect has thanked U.S. President Donald Trump for his respectful attitude toward the incoming Mexican administration and held out hope for joint progress on tackling illegal migration. López Obrador wants to persuade Trump to help foster economic development in Mexico and Central America to complement the affected country's own steps to create better living conditions for their people in order to reduce migration. We are in favor of the continuation of the free trade agreement, NAFTA. We will be the observers during this transitory time. We recognize what the group of negotiation has done, what Mexican negotiators have done. We have received confirmation of those who will attend. It will be United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. White House advisor Jared Kushner will also attend and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. Of course, there will also be Homeland Security Secretary Chris Jen Nielsen and also the person in charge of business at the United States Embassy in Mexico. To sum up, the Secretaries of State, the Treasury, and Homeland Security, the main issues. It's a high-level delegation. Still in Mexico, activists from Greenpeace held a demonstration in front of the headquarters of the BBVA Bancomer Bank. Greenpeace has denounced the bank is funding oil pipelines in the Arctic that are threatening the lives of killer whales and other maritime species, as well as the way of life of indigenous people in the area. The organization has also started collecting signatures so that citizens can pressure the bank into ending the funding of these pipelines. We'll take a short break now, but join us again after a video from our multimedia team.
Welcome back. The Nicaraguan army has denounced the use of fake news and slanderous rumors against their institution. In a public statement, the Nicaraguan army said there is a campaign against the institution and denies any kind of involvement in human rights violations. The army says it has total control over its soldiers and weapons. Meanwhile, violence continues in the streets as the Commission for Truth, Peace and Justice says that at least 234 people have been killed since mid-April. The ambassador of Ecuador in Spain, Cristóbal Roldán, said on Tuesday that if former President Rafael Correa tries to seek asylum in Spain, he would process an extradition request at the order of the Ecuadorian government. Roldán also said Correa's rights will be respected if he returns to Ecuador to face accusations, linking him to the alleged kidnapping of former National Assembly member Fernando Valda in 2012. Correa has rejected all accusations and denounced this as an act of political persecution. In July, an arrest warrant was filed against the former president after he didn't comply with an order to appear in a court in Quito every two weeks, now that Correa has been living in Belgium for over a year. In an exclusive interview with Telesur, Correa shared his views on the current administration one year after Lenin Moreno took office. A few weeks after I left Ecuador, I knew we had been betrayed. Moreno had agreements with the oppositions that were never mentioned to the Alianza País party. For instance, the agreement with the Social Christian Party, they gave the banks, the media and everyone their own share of demands. We knew we were being betrayed, but we never realized how severe it was. The real corruption has surfaced this year, the corruption of using their political power for private benefits. The report issued by the International Monetary Fund rejects all of Lenin Moreno's lies. Despite the drop in oil prices, despite losing trials in international courts, despite the devastating earthquake, we managed to recover our economy without increasing poverty or inequality in record time. U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security Kirsten Nielsen met with foreign ministers from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras in Guatemala City to discuss the flow of immigrants traveling to the U.S. southern border. Mexican Foreign Minister Luis Videgaray and his Central American counterparts reaffirmed their opposition to the separation of families at the border under the zero-tolerance immigration policy pushed by U.S. President Donald Trump. More than 2,300 children were separated from their parents before Trump stopped the measure following public outrage and court challenges. Separar Separating children from parents is a cruel and inhumane action. Everyone who is here agrees on this. We have come together in Guatemala City to take concrete action to first stop this from happening and second to take action towards the prompt reunion of those who have been separated. In El Salvador, protests continue to gain momentum against the possible privatization of water. Citizens and social movements are up in arms to demand their basic human right to water. Public and private sector employees joined forces with the Trade Union Confederation of Salvadoran Workers and marched to the Legislative Assembly. Their demand was clear and simple, and it was to say no to privatization. The Social Environmental Collective represents several national sectors that put forward a constitutional reform proposal that guarantees the human right to water and sanitation. We are demonstrating to the deputies that this fight is life or death because we believe that water is life for the Salvadorian people. And that is what motivates social organizations to be together with the people. In Argentina, pro-abortion rights groups displayed a performance dressed as characters from The Handmaid's Tale. Outside the lower house of Congress, a group of women wearing the characteristic red cape and white hats performed the dystopic novel by Margaret Artwood that became popular thanks to the TV series. The story of a near future in which women are heavily repressed is an inspiration for feminist groups denouncing current aggressions against women. The bill on abortion rights is currently being discussed in the Senate after the, after the lower house passed it on June 14. Street artists also held protests against a bill that they say will restrict street art in capital city Buenos Aires. 
a multitude of clowns, dancers, jugglers and musicians of all kinds said the new law promoted by the city council is aimed to criminalize their performance as it allows for their prosecution with just an anonymous call. They can be detained for up to five days if they are accused of any disturbance. There is around 3,000 street artists in Buenos Aires. You can get charged with a violation that goes from fines to five days arrest for performing any kind of activity on the street without permission. In other countries, festivals are organized around street art, and here they try to eradicate and bury it. Ten policemen belonging to the Chilean intelligence agents in the unit are used of falsifying, accused of falsifying evidence that led to the arrest of a group of Mapuche leaders. They were policemen in charge of the intelligence operations in Chile. Now they are accused of, among other crimes, falsifying proof. This accusation is up to other cases of falsifying evidence and also obstruction of justice. In September 2017, General Blue was the head of the intelligence unit. He told journalists the police arrested a dozen Mapuche leaders who were accused of illicit association and violent acts. We will work day and night because this has just begun. But everything was a lie. The arrest of Mapuche leaders was based on supposed telephone calls they held to plan the attacks. But the evidence was so absurd that the Supreme Court had to set them free as the investigation was happening. A civilian nicknamed The Professor allegedly gave the police software to hack the social media accounts linked to the Mapuche leaders that they didn't use. The intelligence unit started to crumble until the case was closed and its leaders were overwhelmed by their lies. They falsified evidence to frame the Mapuche leaders, but now the policemen are saying that they were tricked. The criminalization of the Mapuche has been happening in the Araucania region for many years now. We have proved that the evidence was forged in each of the cases and the leaders have been absolved. As things took a turn, today there are 10 policemen and one civilian who are facing justice. General Blue is now asking the Mapuche for forgiveness. There was never a clear interpretation in his report of what the accused said. It was all a lie. The police intelligence unit has suffered a major hit, as has the logic that speaks of an internal enemy. As General Blue said, this is only the beginning. Staying in Chile, blind people are now able to enjoy art alongside their sighted counterparts thanks to special street murals placed in capital city Santiago. The murals are paired with relief plaques bearing the image and an explanation of the artwork in Braille. The Hands on the Wall initiative installed six murals with touch panels and an audio description in order to create a new way to access art. Almost 17% of the population in Chile is in a situation of disability. Nearly 48% of them declare severe or extreme difficulty to see without glasses. I am a person just like anybody else, and I have the right to enjoy art. I can see, but there are other parts of me that are useful, that are able to see. A team of researchers in Argentina have discovered a 200 million year old dinosaur in a paleontological site in the San Juan province west of the country. The remains belong to the oldest giant dinosaur species that inhabited the earth. Researchers found vertebrae of the neck and tail, bones of the forelegs and parts of the backs. The Ingenia prima species is about three times the size of the largest Triassic dinosaurs. Until this discovery, it was believed that giant dinosaur species emerged during the Jurassic period 180 million years ago. And now to our World Cup segment, as the last semi-final will be played on Wednesday. Croatia and England will go ahead head to head to decide who will face France for the 2018 FIFA World Cup trophy. And ahead of that semi-final match between Croatia and England, animals are making their predictions. Bartek, a Russian tiger who lives at the Royev Ruchev Zoo in Krasnoyarsk, chose Croatia 
as a winner as, as he picked the Croatian box with his powerful paws. But a group of meerkats disagree. According to them, England's national team will join France in the World Cup final. Tens of thousands of Parisians flooded the Champs-Élysées to celebrate their national team's victory over Belgium as they move forward to the finals of the World Cup. Ecstatic fans danced, sang, waved flags and set off flares all around the avenue, unable to contain their joy at their team's performance. France has now advanced to their third World Cup final and looks for a repeat of their 1998 victory. We'll take one last short break, but join us again after this look at our World of Multimedia colleagues are reporting. Thanks for joining us again. Now let's have a look at some other stories making headlines around the world. A suicide bomber blew himself up at an election rally in northwest Pakistan on Tuesday, killing at least 20 and injuring more than 50. A candidate from an anti-Taliban political party was also killed. Taliban militants have claimed responsibility for the attack. General elections in Pakistan are set for July 25th. We will fight against the terrorists and we will bring peace here, as we have in the past. The Office of Britain's Information Commission has said they intend to fine social media company Facebook over 600,000 of US dollars for breaches of data protection law. Facebook is being investigated for improperly accessing the personal data of over 87 million users via consulting firm Cambridge Analytica. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has already faced various hearings by US and EU lawmakers over the data scandal. A day after the miraculous rescue of the 12 boys and their football coach, Thailand has been celebrating their return. The Chiang Rai hospital, where they are being kept for medical care, has said all of them are in good shape and have been eating well. Hundreds of school children gathered in front of the hospital to cheer the football team. In Iraq, residents of Mosul are still waiting for the reconstruction of their city, one year after pro-government forces won it back from the Islamic State group. Residents see little reason to celebrate the anniversary as buildings lie in ruins, ruins with damage to houses and businesses still visible in the streets. Mosques, houses, schools and other buildings across Mosul are just piles of rubble. 
Although life has gone back to normal in some parts of eastern Mosul, the massive cleanup of the western part of the city only began a few weeks ago. And with that, we come to the end of this news brief. But as you know, this and other stories you can find on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.